the organizers. Well, uh, it's my first experience in giving uh, a talk on Zoom, so hope it would work. Do you hear me well? Hello? Do you hear me well? Yes, I hear you well. Okay, very well. So I continue. So I will talk on a um, joint, uh, recent, very recent joint work with uh, Florian Luca and Amalia Pizarro. Uh, and uh, it's based on the conjecture of one more colleague, uh, Antonin Riffo, who was uh, my PhD student. So, uh, so well, let me start by introducing my co-authors. So, well, just maybe now they are not like this; they all wear masks and so on. But hope this time would will, will be back. And well, let me start from uh, reminding some definitions. Well, our main character of this talk will be singular modulus, singular moduli. What is a singular modulus? It's just by definition, it's J invariant of an elliptic curve having a complex multiplication. So well, I remind what is a J invariant of an elliptic curve given in Weiss transform. But in this talk, uh, in this talk, we will uh, use an alternative uh, equivalent definition is a value of uh, j of tau, where tau is in Poincare plane, is a quadratic irrationality. So it's just an algebraic number of degree two. And j is a function, analytic function, defined on Poincare plane with a very familiar function given with this familiar series. So I'm not going to <coughs> remind more of the, of the definition, so it's standard material. And well, uh, the two definitions are equivalent. If uh, E, the elliptic curve obtained by quotienting uh, the complex plane by the letters generated by two and one, then J invariant of this curve is just J of tau. Okay. And um, there are two main uh, numerical characteristics of uh, singular modulus. First is discriminant of a singular modulus. So define delta sub x. <laughs> it can be defined in two equivalent ways. One is kind of more conceptual way. It is, well, uh, since we have an elliptic curve with complex multiplication, so the reading of endomorphism is set in imaginary quadratic order. And this is the, just the discriminant of this order. And well, when we know the discriminant, we know the order. So for every discriminant, there is exactly one order of the discriminant, which is, which is this order. Or equivalently, well, more computational way. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, well, how in this talk we will understand the definition of the discriminant. So our tool has a minimal polynomial of degree two. Note that I write minus b because I like to put plus b here. So there will be minus b here. And the delta will be just a discriminant of this minimal polynomial. So what we know about discriminants, that well, it's of course negative number because it's imaginary, quadratic. It's also obviously congruent to zero, one, or two. And uh, well, uh, we know that every delta with this property serves as discriminant of some singular models. And now, <laughs> the fundamental fact. So, well, besides discriminant, uh, well, uh, there is a degree of singular modulus, and the fundamental fact that a singular modulus is an algebraic integer, and its degree is equal to the class number of this discriminant. Well, again, I don't want to, of course, to define what's a class number. Well, if discriminant is what is called a fundamental discriminant, so the order is uh, the uh, the maximal order, just the ring of integers of the corresponding imaginary quadratic field, is just the class number of the field. In the general case, one should be a bit careful with defining, but one can again define the class group and the class number and so on. And uh, another 
important fact that, well, for a given discriminant, all singular moduli of this given discriminant form a Galois orbit over here. So we have, uh, uh, since degree is h, then we have exactly h singular moduli of given discriminant, and they all are conjugate over here. These are two fundamental facts that uh, we're going to use throughout the talk. And now what some consequences. For instance, we know that there are 13 discriminants of class number one. This is a famous class number one problem solved by having a start in Baker. And well, uh, here you, you see the list of all these 13 discriminants and the corresponding singular moduli. They must be now algebraic integers of degree one which means they're just rational integers. Now, uh, singular moduli, uh, uh, well, we know there are 29 discriminants of uh, degree of class number two, which means the corresponding singular moduli are in pairs. They are of degree two and uh, they are 29 yellow orbits. 29 such pairs of singular moduli of degree two. There are 25 discriminants of degree three and uh, so on. At present, all discriminants up to degree 100 are known due to the work of Watkins. Okay, and now let me quickly state what is reinforced conjecture. So, uh, Rifo conjectured the following, that a singular modulus of degree at least three cannot be a root of a trinomial defined over rationals. Where by trinomial, everywhere in this talk, by trinomial, I just mean the following polynomial. So it has, well, it monic, has one term of maximal degree, then a certain term of a smaller degree, but positive, and then the free term. This is what I mean by trinomial. Well, in the, we, I do not want to formally assume that the middle coefficient a is not zero, but well, if it is zero, then this conjecture is really very, very easy. It's just an exercise. So, <coughs> so the in problem becomes interesting exactly when a is uh, not zero. And also why h must be at least three, because well, a, h is one, then the singular model is rational number. Obviously it is a root of trinomial. And when h is two, then again, it's a root of trinomial, infinitely many trinomials. Okay. So the problem starts being interesting for h greater than three. And uh, well, uh, this conjecture is open as of now. Now, one may ask for uh, motivation, why it is motivated. Well, to be honest, I don't think I, do, I'm me personally, I don't need any motivation. We have two very classical objects, singular moduli, classical object known since about well, 19th century work of you know, Kronecker, Weber, whatever. And we have trinomials, another very classical, very interesting object. And well, to know how they uh, or kind of uh, their relationship is, is of interest for me, and it is of course a problem of obvious diaphant and flavor. So any problem, interesting diaphant and problem is of interest. I don't need a special motivation for this. But well, maybe not everybody would agree, so I will try to provide some kind of motivation. And motivation comes from uh, the very hot topic as of now, equations with singular moduli. And it all started in uh, 1998 by theorem proved by Ivan Dre, who proved the following theorem. Assume that F is a polynomial. Well, we assume it irreducible and uh, it should not be special polynomial in a certain sense. And then the equation uh, F of X, Y equal to zero has at most finitely many solutions in singular mode. It was uh, the first uh, non-trivial case of what is called Andre or conjecture. Now there is much more, uh, this is much, much more advanced to the work on Andre or conjecture, but well, let us pretend that uh, we don't know about what, what was done later. I would just want to concentrate on, on, this, on this result. 
maybe it worth de defining what are the special polynomials that we have to exclude. So these are polynomials, well, of course, of this kind. In this case, uh, well, I must probably say special times uh, a non-zero non -zero scalar. Well, it's okay. These two is clearly special. And there is one more uh, series of special polynomials are the classical modular polynomials of level N, which are by definition the irreducible polynomials over Z, which are defined or well, satisfy this equation, give the algebraic relation for the Jane variant and the Jane variant of N multiple. Uh, well, um, let me give uh, just example. Well, phi one is clearly X minus Y because it's just J and J. Already phi two is, uh, is a bit, uh, it's somewhat big coefficients. And for phi three, I will need a separate slide, so I don't give it. Basically, well, um, we seldom work with modular polynomials as them, though there is some recent work, for instance, bounding their coefficients with the Pazuki. But for me, well, the good thing about modular polynomials is that they exist, but really I, I try to avoid uh, working with them as, uh, as such. Uh, and well, of course, for these three examples, uh, we have infinitely many solutions. For, instance, for modular polynomial, if this is, if Z is tau imaginary quadratic, then N tau is also imaginary quadratic, so we have two singular models, and tau can derive again. Uh, so we have to exclude them, and when we exclude them and their multiples by a scalar, then we must have finitely many solutions. And um, this theorem, there were many proofs, the original proof of Andre. Then the same year independently, Bas Edixhofen gave a proof. He had to assume GRH, but otherwise it's very nice and conceptual uh, argument and uh, it was further extended. And the recent famous work by uh, uh, Klinger, Ulmoya, Fife, and so on was kind of continuation of this approach. Then a totally different argument was given by Pila, and uh, again it was continued, in, uh, it was using all minimality and uh, this nice stuff. Uh, well, uh, the problem with Andres and Pila's argument that they were non effective. At some moment they had to use Ziegel Brauer. And um, well, about like eight years ago, first effective proofs were given, well, independently by Lars Kühne and uh, my joint work with Masser and Zania. And later, Lars Kühne came uh, with another argument, which I would call very effective, because it was that argument uh, that could be then adapted to obtain really very explicit results. I'm not sure that there was any kind of adaptation with the initial of this argument, so Kuhn and Master Sanyar and myself. And well, I say, well, uh, when you have effective, we want to have explicit, and by adapting this uh, Kuhn's uh, wonderful argument, uh, certain uh, rather explicit results were obtained. For instance, Kuhn himself, Kuhn himself proved the uh, prove the following, uh, that if we consider the equation x plus y equal to one, which is of course the, the simplest non-special algebraic equation, then there are no solutions in single one. Two years after, this was generalized in a joint work with Bill Alombert and Damale Pizarro. If we take three rational numbers, and, uh, well, let us assume, uh, just to avoid some trivialities, that A and B are both non-zero. And consider this uh, equation. And then this equation may have only obvious solutions. This is our result. Well, which are obvious? First obvious solutions are the solutions with x equal to y. 
And of course, when A is minus B and C is zero, then we have the solution. So like a diagonal line, we have plenty of solutions like this. Now, the rational case, it's when both X and Y are rational, and we saw that there are 13 rational uh, singular moduli, so we have quite a few pairs like this. <sighs> then, uh, of course, we can uh, draw many straight lines defined over Q passing through these points. And uh, the third uh, obvious case is the quadratic case. Well, clearly, if we have a solution, then the field Q generated by X over Q and the field generated by Y over Q must be the same. And if this field is of degree two, then what we do, we take our point X, Y, we take X prime, Y prime, the conjugate point over Q. And if we draw a straight line, it will be defined over Q, this line. So, uh, again, we have uh, the solution in this case. And well, our result, there are no other solutions. For instance, there are no solutions when X or Y are of degree uh, at least three. Therefore, generalized partially this result in his work, he considered equation ax to the m plus by to the n equal to c. a, b, c is as before, and m and n are integers, and they again are known. They're not fixed here in, this, in his work. So we have actual equation. Well, let us count uh, basically one, two, three, four, five, and six variables. Well, uh, formally seven, but ABC uh, form a two-dimensional family, so six variables, and uh, solve, uh, solve this equation almost completely. So, uh, Rifo did uh, the main part, but in some cases uh, his method failed, uh, so, and then Florian Luca was listening to his talk and he helped me, him to fix uh, the remaining few cases. And what he proved uh, was the following, that there are only obvious solutions with X distinct from Y. So if we return to the previous slide, we see we had three cases, diagonal, rational, quadratic. The diagonal being the easier, the trivial kind of case. So Rifo proved that if we throw away the diagonal case, the case x equal to y, then only rational case and quadratic case may happen. But, in the case x equal to y, which was the easiest when m and n are just one, in general case, it is the hardest. So his argument did not work in that case. And uh, it's exactly the, that case it reduces to the following problem. Determine singular moduli, which are the roots of trinomials. So if x equal to y, we obtain a trinomial. So of course, it's the case for singular moduli of degree one or two. And the Rifo conjecture that there are no others. This is how this conjecture emerged. And well, uh, as he concedes in uh, his article that we know a lot about trinomials, but well, it's not enough. Our knowledge is not enough to, to prove his conjecture, to rule out all the cases of degree, <laughs> at least three. And now, here is our results. Uh, well, all them appeared recently, in a rather long archive uh, article, like 44 pages or so. Well, our first result is just if we assume GRH, then uh, the four conjecture is uh, true. So there is no trinomial, no trinomial over rationals vanishes at a singular moduli of degree three or more. 
Well, so with GRH, life is, is nice, but well, if we want to do things unconditionally, then, um, uh, well, it's more complicated. And let me introduce uh, well, one definition that will be convenient to use. <laughs> we call a discriminant delta trinomial discriminant if it is uh, was class number at least three, and the singular modulus of this discriminant is the root of rational trinomial. And this is equivalent, of course, to saying all singular modulus of these discriminants are roots of some rational trinomial because they form a Galois orbital, a cube. And therefore, conjecture in these terms can be restated like that these discriminants do not exist. So the rest of this talk will be study. Will be, I will be speaking on uh, kind of potentially, potentially non-existent objects. And uh, <coughs> here are our results about these trinomial discriminants. So first of all, they cannot be too small, they, they at least 10 to 11. Well, they cannot be too big either, but well, we should allow one exception. So with one exception, they can run, uh, run away they're bounded by certain huge number. Well, here we were not very uh, careful about writing, about obtaining optimal bound. Well, maybe it can be reduced to some 10 to 140 or 120, but I don't think one can do substantially better with using our methods. So anyway, there is some total explicit bound for all but one. Now, these trinomial discriminants are not just arbitrary. They are very, very special. They are either minus prime number or minus product of two distinct prime numbers. And distinct odd prime numbers, of course. In particular, they are all fundamental discriminants and they are odd discriminants. They cannot be zero mod four. And our last results is about trinomial itself, which also must be uh, kind of very special. So if trinomial vanishes at a singular modulus, and here we should impose certain conditions of so singular modulus of sufficiently big discriminant, well, this is a kind of lazy assumption. So I think that if we work harder, perhaps we could eliminate this assumption, but I'm not sure. So let's assume that the discriminant is sufficiently big. And if trinomial vanishes at singular modular of such discriminant, then the two uh, non-constant terms are of almost same degree. So the degrees, uh, this you know, can be, so n can be only m minus one or m minus two, cannot be smaller. So these are our results on uh, Rifo's uh, conjecture. So in the rest of this talk, I'll try to give an idea how we prove, well, at least uh, the first four theorems. If time permits, I will also say a few words how we prove uh, the last theorem about uh, uh, trinomials, which is probably the most sophisticated of all uh, of them. Uh, so, but, well, uh, I will start by uh, some giving some basic facts about trinomials and singular moduli and uh, putting special emphasis on this uh, trinomial discriminants. And, uh, well, uh, then um, I will uh, say a few words how we obtain this lower bound and uh, how we prove this structural theorem. And after this, uh, Proving uh, the conditional theorem and proving the upper bound will be just through very, very classical analytic number theorem. And well, as I say, if time permits, I will also say a few words about the last. Okay, so let's start from trinomials. So the basis of everything is uh, the following uh, innocently looking uh, lemma. So if we have a trinomial, just with complex coefficients, 
And we have, it has three roots where W is the biggest and X and Y are uh, smaller. So and X bigger than Y. <laughs> then uh, we have this inequality. So X over W is, is kind of small number and it raised to the power M minus N and since M is bigger than N, it's also just, you can also put here just one. And for most application, just one is sufficient, but for the very last theorem about trinomials, M minus N would play a role. And what it means informally? Formally, it means the following, that if a trinomial has three roots and of these three roots, one is much, much bigger than the two others, then these two others, must be of almost the same absolute value. So you see, y over x must be very close to one and x over there. And the proof is very easy. So this discriminant must be vanish, must vanish. And now what we do, we take the two biggest, so we have six terms in this discriminant, the two biggest of them are those which involve W to the M, and then they must involve X to the N and Y to the N, and we put them on the left, and uh, the absolute value is uh, this, or these two, or these two terms together. And it must be bounded by the sum of absolute values uh, with the sum of absolute values of uh, four other terms. And these terms are bounded by, well, the biggest of them is like Wn xm, all the other are even smaller. So it's bounded by four times this. So it's very loose bound. Actually in the article we'll use uh, something, more, uh, something more exact, but here well, for the talk, this loose bound Okay, now we divide, we obtain, uh, we obtain this, this inequality. And uh, note that this is, uh, well, just by triangle inequality this, and since y is, over x is, uh, is smaller than one, that's greater than the center. And we're done. So, Proof is, is just totally trivial, but it is what, uh, what we use. Okay, so basically we don't use, uh, use very little beyond this about uh, trinomials. At one point we also use a trinomial cannot have more than four real roots. I don't think that we use anything else about trinomials. We also obtain a similar result uh, of a, well, in periodic metric, in non Archimedean case, which is also used in some cases, but well, for the purposes of this talk, I prefer not to touch it. Yuri, um, yes? may I have a question, please, for a question? Fabian, would you please ask your question? Yes, please, Fabian. You just answered the question. <laughs> ah, I answered. Okay. Okay, good. Sorry. Now, now let us speak about singular moduli. And uh, again, I, I want to speak about some very classical fact, which is well, it's called, well, I think goes back to Gauss. Consider a set of triples, ABC, of integers, which satisfy certain conditions. So just well, for every for given delta. So delta is b squared minus 4ac, so it should be. And they're also co-prime. And they satisfy certain, well, inequalities. And the inequalities are equivalent to saying just that this number belongs to the standard fundamental domain. You know this nice picture. And, uh, well, uh, work of Gauss, of course, Gauss did not use this terminology, but his work can be interpreted like this, that there is a bijection between this set and the singular moduli of you know, discriminant delta, which is given by, by this. So to H triple ABC, we associate J at, uh, evaluated at uh, this number. 
And in particular, this set T delta has exactly H of delta elements. So there are exactly H of delta triples like this. And what is crucial for more, more or less uh, well, all results on this explicit uh, Andre Oort or this explicit uh, solving equations with singular moduli is uh, among these triples, there is exactly one triple with A equal to one, one BC triple. Well, which I give here explicitly. So there is one and there can be no more, but one there is. And the corresponding singular moduli, well, just the discriminant, well, there will be no A here, just two. The corresponding singular modulus, we will call dominant singular modulus for the discriminant data. Okay, now let us uh, let us see what is uh, how how the these triple A B C and the corresponding singular modulus relate. So we have uh, for J we have we remember this uh, expansion and you see there is uh, the main term Q minus one which is kind of big term and the other terms are smaller. And well, when they are small, when the imaginary part of Z is uh, separated from zero, in this case, we just can uh, bound all what is left. So it will be just Q minus one and uh, something bounded, bounded in terms of epsilon. And uh, well, this same holds true also for absolute values. And this is what we're going to use. Now, if we have a triple ABC, what we have then B can be positive or negative, but an absolute value is bounded by A and then bounded by C. And this implies, well, by this simple argument that A is bounded by square root of delta, even square root of delta divided by square root of three. And in particular, the imaginary part is uh, well separated from zero. Well. You can also observe it by just noting that this belongs to the fundamental domain. So it's well separated from zero, and this means that uh, what is the Q, the absolute value of Q minus one is uh, just this number, exponent of pi square root of delta divided by A. So our singular modulus is uh, this plus some bounded guide. So we have a very good idea about size of our singular modulus when we know this number A that corresponds. So it's just A root of this guy plus something. And in particular, for dominant, A is one. So we have a very big have exponent of pi square root of delta. So really, really very, very big guy. And if it is not dominant, then A is at least two. So we have at most square root. So dominant is much, much bigger than all other singular modules. And this is crucial for us because, well, when we start, we well, you remember trinomials, when there is one big root, then all the other big, smaller roots, we can say something, <coughs> something very good. Look what happens. So, so if we just take singular modulus of given discriminant, on a complex plane, probably I had to write singular moduli of given discriminant delta on a complex plane. So in general, we have one guy which is dominant. And by the way, it is real because it is only one. If there are two, then they, if it is not real, then there must be also its complex conjugate, but we cannot have two, there's only one dominant. So it must be real. It can be real positive, like on this picture. It can also be real negative, but it is real. And all the others are much smaller, but kind of we don't have much information. They're kind of chaotic. If we don't impose any restriction on our discriminant. But if our discriminant is trinomial, then again, there is one bigger dominant and the others are much smaller and even really, really very small. So you see it's bounded by some power of delta. 
this is what we prove. And they have almost the same absolute value. You see, it's kind of like almost on the circle. Yes, I intentionally did it. It's not a circle. It's kind of a good approximation to a circle on this page. So they, you should think of them as like almost on the of same absolute value. And this is uh, what we use uh, in, uh, in our arguments. Okay, so we saw that the number A plays an important role and well, uh, we probably should give it some name. So let us call uh, an integer A suitable for a given discriminant if it emerges as A in some triple ABC. <coughs> so there are some properties of this suitable. So as we have already seen, one is always suitable for every discriminant. And the suitable, it is bounded by square root of delta divided by square root of three. And uh, we also obtain some recipes for detecting these suitable integers for various kinds of discriminants. For instance, for even discriminants that are, well, not too small, either two or four or eight must be suitable. Now, very important, if P is a prime number, such that the Kronecker is one, and again, it's not too big, well, some bound like this. Well, one would expect here three, but actually we can prove it only to four. Then P must be suitable. Next one. Well, uh, well, sorry, uh, in particular, well, also this holds for P equal to two. And what is the Kronecker of delta two is just one, if delta is one with eight. So if delta is one with eight, and if not minus seven, then two is suitable. And here, well, is co-prime suitable with uh, some co-prime guy, but well, uh, if <coughs> also divisor of delta can be suitable, it must then satisfy which condition. It must be really an exact divisor. So can uh, capture all the primes uh, it uh, touches. So a, a and delta over A must be co-prime. And again, A should not be too big. In this case, A will be well, we obtained some more sophisticated uh, recipes for detecting suitable integers and we use them in our argument, but for, for this talk it's enough. Just these uh, properties. And uh, well, so far delta was more or less arbitrary. Now what happens when delta is a trinomial discriminant? Well, in this case, well, one is always suitable, but Beyond one, uh, we have very, very strong uh, uh, constraints for suitable integers. Exactly. They must be very big. You remember that um, suitable integers cannot exceed square root of delta, but uh, they are almost like square root. So square root uh, divided by logarithm. So they're really, really almost as big as uh, we want them to be big. Well, um, how we prove it? Uh, well, uh, let's take uh, the smallest of the suitable bigger than one. And uh, let's take one other suitable. Well, uh, it's a subtle question that this other exists because a priori there can be only one and one more suitable integer. Well, I prefer to not to discuss this question why it exists. It's, let, let us assume that it does. And let x and x prime be two corresponding uh, singular moduli. They are not dominant, which means that, uh, as we saw, they must be of more or less same absolute value. But what we know about their absolute values? For x, it is, uh, it is this guy, a root of uh, exponent of pi square root of delta, and for x prime is a prime's root. And a prime is bigger than a, so it's at least a plus one. So 
And now when A is very small, then this guy is much, much bigger than this guy, you see. For instance, when A is two, then this will be square root and this will be cube root, cubic root of, uh, of some very big number. So they cannot be almost the same and so on. And we stop getting contradiction only if A is enormous. And this is uh, how we prove. Well, uh, the actual proof is like about three pages. So, but the idea is, uh, is here. Any questions? I'm sorry, no? So now let us see how we can use it. So this is already more or less sufficient to prove uh, the lower bound. Well, uh, as one can expect, uh, we prove this lower bound by running several Pari scripts. And for deltas in the range from the previous theorem, so you remember that the delta should be a bit big here. Actually, one can put something like 10 to the three by uh, compromising of this constant three, like making it two, but well, let's put it like, like here. And uh, well, for all deltas in this range, we show that uh, there is a prime, rather small, small prime, with a positive chronicle. And such prime must be suitable, but uh, suitable for a trinomial delta must be bigger than this. And this prime is always small. So there can be no suitable in this range. Well, we don't just check every discriminant. This would be too long. <coughs> Instead, we use setting sieving procedure. We start just sieving. Uh, we sieve away all primes with uh, Kronecker, uh, well, all, all deltas with Kronecker uh, over two. So we take away all primes, which are one or eight. Then with Kronecker three and so on. And after some moment, we just uh, get an empty list. So um, the problem with sieving procedure, it goes rather well. The pro processor time is uh, quite good, about five, six minutes but uh, it requires a lot of memory because we have to make uh, big lists in this scene. Uh, well, for smaller deltas, we just indeed check everyone. We just check our inequality for trinomials. We simply detect three roots, W, X, and Y, detect three singular moduli such that this inequality is not satisfied. And we did it for all smaller delta with class number bigger than three. With class number three it does not work because we have just three guys, the dominant one and two other which are complex conjugate. X and Y are complex, complex conjugate. So Y over X is one. So this inequality is trivially satisfied. So the discriminants with class number equal to three, they require some special treatment. Uh, it was, uh, this is where we needed our periodic uh, considerations and uh, well, how we dealt with them would require one uh, another talk. So I just leave this, leave this point out. And well, uh, this was about five, six minutes here, about four or five minutes for this step and well, uh, this step was theoretically hard, but computationally it was very quick. So about 10 minutes on kind of like, and as I said, uh, the processor time was not the bottleneck, the bottleneck was the memory. So because of the ceiling. Okay, so now we know that they cannot be too small and this gives us certain room for maneuver. So we know that we deal with very big discriminants in particular, we can replace this three by four for this big discrepancy. Let's continue. Now, the next uh, result was uh, about uh, how, about the structure. The structure was uh, of the form, uh, well, uh, 
to say must be either minus p or minus pq. And again, we do this just in all other cases. We detect a small suitable integer and the trinomial discriminant, we know it cannot have a small suitable integer. So for instance, for even, the easiest way, the easiest thing is just to rule out all even discriminants because for them, two, four, or eight must be suitable. Also, it's easy to rule out discriminants having more than two prime uh, distinct prime divisors. Because, well, the smallest, if we take the smallest prime power of them, it is, uh, it must be suitable and it is very small. It's like cubic root of that. And here we have square root divided by log. Also, for instance, squares can be taken away for minus squares because for them, uh, either 5 or 13 or 17 must be suitable. So again, we have very small suitable and so on. But each step we have to be more and more sophisticated at the end we really need uh, like to, um, uh, for instance, to eliminate the case P squared times Q, we need about two pages. But the idea was the same, just to detect a small suitable. And now after this preparation, well, uh, well, we can just profit with uh, analytic number theory, which was already done before us. And this is how we prove the conditional result. So that GRH implies reforce conjecture. So we use the following, uh, we use a work, recent work by Lamzuri, Lee and Sundarajan. Well, chi is a primitive real character, let chi be modulo some number m. And if we assume GRH, then uh, there exists uh, a <coughs> very small uh, uh, residue, prime residue for this uh, character. Yeah. So, uh, well, um, Actually, their result is much more general, but this is what, what we need from their result. Now, let delta be our trinomial discriminant and let M uh, be its absolute value, then the Kronecker is just a primitive real character mod M. It must be primitive because delta is fundamental. And we obtain a contradiction if the right hand side is smaller than something like this. But well, this is true for M bigger than something like 10 to 21. And this is because of this 10 to the nine uh, term. Which is not enough for us because we know that M is bigger than 10 to 11, but not 10 to 21. So we have to slightly adapt the argument to little, little work. And we indeed managed to prove what we needed. So if we take uh, this character, then we can put also this right hand side and so we're done. So this is how we prove the conditional result. And in a totally similar fashion, we prove uh, the we prove the upper bound for all guy but one. Again, we use some classical analytic number theory. Again, let chi be as before. And then there is a linear Kinogradov, famous linear Kinogradov theorem that there is, a, there is a prime number P bounded by M to one fourth plus epsilon with uh, chi of P equal to one. Well, perhaps one should impose, I think linear Kinogradov themselves put this for prime M. I think uh, the proof extends uh, for Square free or cube free M, at least uh, I don't maybe, maybe not in full generality, but well, uh, it's more than sufficient for us. But well, the good news is that this is smaller than square root because well, it's one fourth and just one half, so it's smaller. But the bad news is that the implied constant is non effective. Why right, it is non effective? Because uh, there are two ingredients in the linear Vinogradov's argument the Burgess, which is effective, and Ziegel which is non-effective. And as well people do, there is this uh, poor man's effective Ziegel, which is Tatu Zava theorem, that uh, we have this totally effective lower bound 
for the L of, L of one time, but for all M with at most one exception. And this is what we use. And uh, after some, uh, well, uh, rather messy calculations, we prove that with at most one exception, every trinomial discriminant bigger than this, we find the prime with this property and this gives a contradiction. So this only one exception, it can be such a trinomial discriminant. All the others simply do not exist. <coughs> well, I think that, uh, well, um, um, do I have time for the proof of the last slide? If the organizers would say. Maybe two or three more minutes? Two or three, well, maybe, maybe four. Okay. okay. And well, the last theorem that we prove is uh, that the trinomial cannot be very, must be very special, cannot be just arbitrary. Let me indicate uh, how we prove a slightly weaker result with m minus n at most four. So, first of all, we know that uh, we, we can see that the class number is at least six, and well, even is at least. Uh, 100 by the work of Watkins, because Watkins listed all, at least fundamental discriminant of class number at least 100, and they are much smaller than our 10 to 11. So class number is big. So we have a lot of freedom for choosing our roots, and the trinomial can have only four real roots. So we can take, uh, two non-real singular moduli of our discriminant delta and uh, such that uh, they're not equal and so both x, x bar, y, y bar are all this. And we consider the number z, which is uh, this number. Well, uh, it's uh, not a very hard lemma to show that it cannot be zero, that x, x, y, x bar cannot be equal to y, y bar. It's, it's not hard. So it is a non-zero real algebraic integer. And we know that, uh, that this x and y have very close absolute value and the actual inequality is uh, like this. So it should be m minus where n if we forget about this guy, 0 0.01, m minus n times pi delta minus pi square root of delta. And this 0, 0, 001 is just some generic small number that takes care of certain noise. And the hard stuff was to show that this indeed noise it does not contradict. <laughs> now, let's consider it's, as I said, a real algebraic number. And what are its conjugates? Just we run over all Galois stuff. And among its conjugates, well, its conjugates are all of, of this guy, of this kind. They no longer, x1, x2, no longer uh, complex conjugate, they can be anything. But among the conjugates of Z, there are exactly four where one of these four guys is the dominant guy. So x1 can be dominant, but they're all distinct. So x2, y1, y2 are not dominant and, uh, and so on. So we get four of them where one of these guys is dominant and these are big guys. All the other guys are not big. And again, uh, so what we obtain, we obtain for the norm, for the product of conjugates, this upper bound. Again, this is four. 0 0.0, 0 0.1 is just to take care of some noise. And, uh, and this is Z, it also in, uh, occurs in the norm and it, uh, it, uh, it takes care. The, the norm is really much smaller than what we expect. But this is algebraic integer. The norm cannot be, cannot be smaller than one. And this means that M minus N M minus N cannot be smaller than like something like 4.02 and whatever. It's at most four. And to get reduced to two, we use again some PADIC arguments and we are, instead of the trivial lower bound for the norm, we obtain a non-trivial lower bound for the norm. We showed simply that it's divisible by many, many prime numbers. 
And this gives this non-trivial. So it will be something like uh, two, two point, uh, two dot something. Yes, well, fortunately we cannot go further. So this is all what we wanted to, oh, I wanted to say. So thank you very much. And well, these are my cats who tried hard to help me to prepare this talk. So thank you.